Thumbs up. All right, so we are going live now, so I want to welcome everybody online and in person. Um, it's really great to be back with everybody. I feel like we haven't been here in forever. I guess we haven't been here for a while, but, you know, we were out one week. We had COVID last week, so we're, you know, definitely better. Um, just one little note is when I'm talking, I feel like I'm talking with my nose all held together, but um, one note is when I'm talking today, Talking stirs up congestion, so I may have to cough a little bit, so be patient with me. I'm not contagious. I'm not contagious. I'm negative, so don't want to par make anyone paranoid. But anyway, so hopefully God will give me the grace to preach today. I believe he will. But uh, anyway, it's really great to be with everybody again. Really missed everybody. Um, I want to share, I want to start by just sharing a, a testimony I had that was really a powerful testimony as a lot of you know, we went to the Terry Bennett conference a couple weeks ago, and on Saturday night, this lady came up to me, and I, you know, I'm just going to be really honest. This lady came up to me, and she says, "The Lord gave me a word for you." And my first reaction was like, "Oh God." <laughs> I mean, I, I hate that it's come to that in the prophetic, but it really has, you know, and you probably feel the same way as well as I do, that it's like, you know, I, I rolled, probably rolled my eyes like Anna rolls her eyes and I tell her to take out the trash. But anyway, I was like, okay. Uh, and, and so, and anyway, she shared this word with me, and I'll share in a second, but I asked her, I said, okay, do you, I, I, did, I, I just wanted to make sure she didn't know who I was, because, you know, I've spoken at his conference a few times. And I published, you know, released a book there uh, um, one time. And so I just wanted to make sure, okay, do you know that I've spoken here before? Do you know anything about me? And she says, I, I've never seen you. I've never met you. I don't know anything about you. I was like, okay, that's great. So anyway, she, um, she said, I just, when I was in worship, I saw this man and he had written a book and the, there was a book that was in his mouth that came out of him. He had written a book, and the word of the Lord, or the, the word of the Lord to him was, release the book. And I sat there, and I was like, wow, okay, this lady has no idea who I am. She has no idea anything going on. She has no idea that I have actually written the book, <laughs> and it was actually with the editor, even as we were speaking. And it was incredibly encouraging because uh, just to be honest with you you know unless you've you know written stuff before you may not understand the the battles you go through but you know I was like sitting there you know battling like I've been working on this for about a year I was like God you know just getting weary and tired and just like ugh, the monotony of it over and over and over. And I'm like, God, should I even publish this thing? I mean, who's going to read? Who's even going to read it? I mean, I know my mom will read it, but I mean, maybe Judy Kitchens. But I mean, is anyone else really going to read this book? And it was as if the Lord was saying, you've written, I mean, it was amazing. You've written the book, release the book. And I just tell you, I know prophetic ministry has gotten a bad rap lately, but that really did exactly what 1 Corinthians 14 talked about is it, it really gave me this incredible encouragement to finish what God had told me to do. And it was very encouraging to know, okay, this was not just something I just came up with a good idea and I'm just writing it. You know, it was like the Lord really had commissioned me to do that. So anyway, I just, I, I was talking to someone. I was like, you know, I should probably share this out loud. But anyway, the book is coming out in Dwelling Life in uh, hopefully September, October time frame. So anyway, just uh, very, very excited about that. So that was very encouraging. So anyway, so that just wanted to share that as we get started. But I am uh, this, I'm, I'm in a series right now, 50 lessons for 50 years. And I, I did the first one about two or three weeks ago. But the, the main theme is this, is I don't know about you, but I love when I hear people write a blog or podcast or when people ask questions, okay, you know, you're older and um, what would you tell your 25-year-old self? What advice would you give your 25-year-old self? You know, knowing what you know now and knowing the experiences you have, what advice would you give your 25-year-old self? And so I, I've said, okay, I'm going to write down 50 things I would tell my 25-year-old self. And I did, I think I did seven or eight of them last week. I'm going to pick up 
uh, this week with doing, uh, I think there's going to be five more. And so go ahead and, and turn in your Bibles to uh, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 3. Is, you know, th there's that saying that says that, that a wise person learns from their mistakes. A wiser person learns from others' mistakes, but, a, but the wisest of all learns from the mistakes and the experiences of others. And I, I, think, I think you can learn so much just by, just by looking back at your life and going, okay, what have I learned? What would, you know, just even the process of writing down, what would I tell my 25-year-old self? Um, Proverbs 1 verse 3 says that a wise man will hear and increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. And so this second part of this message is hopefully, 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 I, I can help you in any way I can of like, okay, what is it if you were just at the beginning, or even if you're not at the beginning, wherever you're at in that journey of pursuing Jesus Christ, anything I can do to share it? Because this is some, some really important stuff. I, I want to help you with that. And that's the the heart and the intention of this series. And so picking up uh, with what, where we left off is, uh, you know, we did eight, so we're at number nine, is number nine is loving God as your first love is the fullness of wisdom. Loving God as your first love is the fullness of wisdom. Proverbs 9.10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but it's not the fullness of wisdom. Loving God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength is the fullness of wisdom. But we need a beginning. We need a beginning, and the beginning is the fear of the Lord. And I know we've been praying for that a lot lately, the fear of the Lord. If you want the fear, raise your hand if you want the fear of the Lord. Okay, I'm going to tell you exactly how to get it. I read this, I've been reading this book by this man named Brian Melvin. And he had a near-death experience. And, and I don't just believe everyone I hear. I check him out. This one's definitely, I believe, very, very much true. He had a near-death experience and he went to hell. <laughs> it, it is the most intense thing I've ever heard in my life. I mean, I'm reading the book and it is, it, it's just, you, you can hardly get through it. It's so intense. It's so sobering. And, um, you know, just the, the, I highly recommend it. If you can listen to his testimony or read his book to, to do it. It, 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 sh it just shakes you to the core of what hell is really like. And, you know, we don't talk a lot about hell in the church anymore. And I, I just been reading this and watching this, and you get to the point like, God, I don't even want to have a bad thought. I mean, it's just the fear of God comes on you, and you don't want to have one bad thought. I mean, it, it is, it's so intense of what he experienced and how the Lord rescued him and saved him. I'm not going to really share too much, but just to say, you reap what you sow. What you sow in this life is what you reap. And we want to live in the fear of God. We want to live in the fear of the Lord. We do not want to sin against the Lord. But the fear of the Lord is only the beginning of wisdom. Okay? If all you have is the fear of God, you're going to live your entire life walking around being afraid to sin. And that's going to be the majority of what your life is about. <laughs> You're, you're, going to live a, you're going to live like Martin Luther did before he had a revelation of justification by faith where he would go to the priest and he would confess his sins and he would spend six to eight hours confessing every single sin he could think of, even taking pride that he was confessing his sins and even taking pride that he got proud that he prayed and all this stuff. And you just become this miserable person if all you have is the fear of the Lord. We need the fear of the Lord, but the fear of the Lord is only the beginning of wisdom. The fullness of wisdom is loving the Lord with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That is the fullness of wisdom. See, the greatest thing you can give you, yourself to is to enjoy God. <clears throat> it's to enjoy God. 
Enjoy God. In his presence is fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. So many Christians are walking around miserable. Yes, they have the fear of God. Yes, they're, they're trying not to sin. But they're miserable without any joy in, in the Lord, in the relationship with the Lord, because they're not enjoying God. The fullness of wisdom is making Jesus your first love and finding in him passion. Jack Deere said this, that passion for the Son of God will conquer a thousand evils in our hearts and is the most powerful weapon against evil in our lives. You want to overcome sin, passion for the Son of God will allow you to conquer whatever sin you are struggling with. Passion, finding that enjoyment in God, finding that pleasure in God, finding that joy in God. John Piper said famously that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. And that the chief end of man is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. See, if you don't have that, that, that I would call it that pleasure muscle inside of you, exercise to find pleasure in God, you're going to just be a miserable person. <laughs> Or you're going to find your pleasure elsewhere besides in the Lord. Find your pleasure in God. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So yes, we need the fear of the Lord. We need the fear of the Lord, but that's only the beginning. That's only the beginning. The fullness of wisdom is making the Lord himself your chief joy your chief enjoyment, that he is my passion, he is my pleasure, he is the source of my joy, Jesus Christ himself. Number 10, establish your identity in God's love. Establish your identity in God's love. If you haven't noticed, there is a major identity crisis in the world today. Everyone is just searching frantically to find their identity. We want to find our identity. And part of that is because of the way God made us. But, you know, identity determines uh, how you view yourself. It determines the way you see yourself. It determines whether you give value to who you are and worth to who you are. And there's a million different things that we can try to find our identity in. We can find it in the way we look, or we can find it in our body. We can, or, you know, being in shape, or we can feel low self-esteem if we're overweight, or whatever it is, a million things. How much money you make, and how educated you are, how intelligent you are, what your career is, how much influence you have, who your friends are, what house you live in, your spouse, your children, uh, your accomplishments. I mean, there's so many things, you know what I'm saying? We can find our identity in and that the world is finding their identity in. But if you put your identity in anything other than Jesus Christ, it is going to shake you. Because you're going, if, if all of a sudden, if your identity is in things and how you look and how much money you have and how smart you are and in your education or in your career, or how much money you make or whatever it is, if your identity is in those things, your world is going to shake when those things come crumbling down in some way. So God does not want us to establish our identity in things. And see, what happens is when we put our identity in certain things in the way we look or in how much money we make or what our family's like or who we know or how much influence we have or how successful we are or whatever it might be, when we put our identity in those things, when the going is good, we look at ourselves and we feel a sense of pride and, and self-righteousness. When the going is bad, we look at ourselves and we feel low self-esteem and low self-worth. See, what has happened as a believer in Jesus Christ is we've taken our focus off of Christ to ourselves to measure how good or not good we are. And we put our value in those things rather than taking our eyes off Jesus Christ, rather than taking our eyes off Jesus. And so my, my advice to my younger 25-year-old self would be don't establish your identity in anything else but God and his love for you. 
it is going to set you up for massive failure, okay? Massive shaking and, you know, you're going to just have this identity crisis and we're finding this in our world today and, you know, even this whole LGBTQ stuff that's going on is so much it is in my sexual identity or my gender identity and all the different things with racism going on, my identity or whatever. Listen, our identity should be in Jesus Christ and in him alone, in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, male nor female, slave or free man, but you are all one in Jesus Christ. He is your identity. See, your identity is, a, as a believer in Jesus Christ, your identity is like the Apostle John. I love this about John. If you read this, his Gospels, I love this about John. John was writing and he called himself, I love this, the disciple whom Jesus loved. I mean, can, can you imagine? I'm writing a book. Can you imagine? I am the disciple whom Jesus loves. I mean, that almost sounds so arrogant, but it wasn't arrogant. I mean, that's what John wrote in his book. I love that. He was so confident in the love of God, and he had drank of the love of God and experienced the love of God, and the love of God had been so poured out upon his heart, and he experienced... Uh, what Psalm 63 talks about, your love is better than life. He experienced that to such a degree, John was like, I, my identity, my core identity is rooted in the fact that I am the disciple whom Jesus loves. See yourself that way. You are the disciple whom Jesus loves. Let your identity be rooted and grounded in the love of God and let that establish your identity so that you're not trying to find it in other things but Jesus himself. See, as a Christian, we want to, we want to find our identity. We want to see, okay, what is it that makes us successful? And we're not, we, can't, we can't judge that through the grid of the world. The grid of the world is what have you done? What have you accomplished? How much money you make? How famous are you? How much influence do you have? None of that means anything in heaven. I can assure you everything in heaven revolves around the Son of God. And so what really matters is when we stand before him, what matters to God shouldn't be what matters to us. And the way God views us is the way we should view ourselves. And what God says about us is what we should say about ourselves. What does God say about you? He says, you're a child of God. You have the very DNA of Jesus Christ inside of you. You are betrothed to Jesus Christ as a bride. You are, the, the Lord himself loves you. The Father loves you just as much as, as he loves Jesus. Jesus loves you just as much as the Father loves him. That is amazing. That is amazing that the, the love of God is so intense and focused on you. He loves you just like he loves Jesus Christ. Now, you're hearing me and, and just the natural process is that now becomes knowledge. But knowledge can't do anything for us. Knowledge puffs up. What we need is experience. What we need is to experience the love of God, to experience the love of Christ. That's what Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 3. He said that you might experience, I'm paraphrasing, but that you might know the height and the width and the breadth and the length and the depth of the love of Jesus Christ and that you might be filled up with all the fullness of God that surpasses knowledge. If you've ever experienced the love of God, you know, you just begin to weep and you begin to cry and you look like a crying baby. I remember, I don't know, 25 years plus years ago when the Lord started revealing his love to me, all I could do was for about a year was just weep and cry. People would look at me, you okay? Yeah, Jesus loves me, you know? It's like you sing about it in Sunday school, but you're actually experiencing that love and there's no tangible explanation for it. It just defies knowledge. God says you're successful because he loves you unconditionally. No matter what you do, God says, I love you unconditionally no matter the way you attribute or 
qualify yourself. God says you are valuable. You are invaluable to me. If there was only one person alive, I would have died just for you. The Son of God feels that way about you. He loves you uniquely as if you were the only person that ever existed. And see, when we feel that emotion, when we feel that love, when we feel that passion, then we can say, I am loved by God. I am a lover of God. Therefore, I am successful. That's what Mike Bickle, it's a quote from Mike Bickle. I am a lover of God and I love God. Therefore, I am successful. Our identity needs to be rooted in the fact that God himself who spoke and the universe was created, God himself loves you with an unconditional love that defies knowledge that if you tasted one taste of the love of God, you would be ruined forever. Nothing satisfies like the love of God. And in that relationship that he has for you, he says, you are, the, the world might define you by the way you look. The world might define you by how much money you make. The world might define you by how much influence you have, by how much success you have, by the kind of house you live in, by the people you know. The world might define you by those things, but God says, I don't define you by that. Don't put your identity in the way the world does. Put your value and your worth in the way God views you and the way God sees you and he loves you. Put your identity in that. Like John, I... My identity is in the fact that I am loved by God. That's my identity. That's who I am. I'm not going to be defined by the way the world sees me. So I would say to my, my younger self, okay, listen, you're, you're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're 25, okay? You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna get older, and you're going to be tempted to put your, your value or your worth in how much money you make or the way you look, or um, how, how many people you know, or how much influence you have, or how far up you go up the corporate ladder, or whatever. Don't do that. It's a recipe for disaster. Root yourself in the love of God. If you don't know the, the way God feels about you, and it's just knowledge, if it's just Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so, and it's just what you know as a kid, as knowledge, but you've never experienced it, spend time in the presence of God crying out to the Lord, Father, show me the love of God in Jesus Christ. Let me experience it. You've got to experience it. You've got to experience it. And, and it's something you've got to experience daily of the way he feels about you, uniquely you. So don't put your identity in things. Number 11, the reward of love is love. The reward of love is love. Now, I got this from Misty Edwards' song, You Set Your Love on Me, but the reward of love is love, is when you give your heart to love God and you experience his love and you return that love back to him, the reward you get for that is more love. And you might think, okay, well, that sounds boring. You're, you're telling me that's like, that's it? That's, I'm saying, if that sounds boring to you, you have never experienced what that's like. This is what eternity is all about, is that we in this life would truly give ourselves to love God with everything in our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then the reward of making Jesus our first love is that we would then be empowered with the capacity to love him and to experience his love unhindered for all of eternity and to love him the very way he's loved us. There's nothing, I'm convinced, nothing compares to that in this life. That's why the psalmist said in Psalm 63, 3, your love is better than life. That's why the bride in the Song of Solomon said, your love is better than wine. There is no greater pleasure than experiencing the love of God. And then in that place of love, loving him back with awakened emotions in your heart. See, once you've tasted of that, it ruins you for everything. So Jesus told the church of Ephesus, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. 
If we lose our first love, we lose everything. If we lose our first love, we have already started a fall spiritually. It's that important. That's why Jesus coming into the book of Revelation, before he addresses anything else, he comes to this issue of first love and he says, don't lose your first love. If you lose your first love, everything else about your life will get out of balance, will get out of order. Return to me, return, repent. Repent and do the things you did at first. See, we, we cannot lose our first love. Jesus must be the passion of our hearts. We must fight and war and contend against everything that would, that would try to get us distracted from that place of intimacy and devotion to Christ. So Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, as I am concerned that just as, as Eve was led astray, that the, the serpent might lead you astray from that simplicity and that purity of devotion to Jesus Christ. And so if you, if you study Revelation, let's actually turn to Revelation chapter 2. If you study Revelation chapter 2, you see this principle, the reward of love is love. Jesus said that, and I just read it, but in verse 4, chapter 2, verse 4, but I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent. Repent means that you turn back and make him your first love. And you do the, the deeds you did at first, or else I'm coming to you and I will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Then he says in, in verse 7, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, I want to say this. As, as, as I, I explain this in my book, The Eternal Blueprint, but just want to say this. As I really do believe that this tree of life, not only does it give you an impartation, a greater impartation of the love of Jesus, or the life of Jesus Christ into you in eternity. It not only does that, I believe because God's love is his life, God's love is an expression of his life, it overflows out of his life, that when you actually eat from this tree of life, it will give you that, that new ability to love God like you've never loved him before. In other words, the reward of love is love. If you make Jesus the first love of your life, then in this life, you'll experience greater feelings of loving him and you'll go into a deeper relationship with him. But also in all of eternity, you will be able to eat from the tree of life, which will give you the capacity and the ability to love Jesus like the Father loves him. I, I, can't, even, I can't even fathom what that is like when, when dormant emotions are awakened and you feel for him the way he feels about you. You know, this is going to be one of the things the Lord gives to his overcoming bride to equip her to love the bridegroom for all eternity. He's going to give her the tree of life. He's going to, she's going to partake of the tree of life and eating that tree of life is going to awaken emotions, awaken passion. So the only thing you'll ever want to do for all of eternity is just to adore and worship Jesus Christ. And you will be fully satisfied and will not be bored for one second. And the thought of doing anything else will sound like drudgery. Even ruling and reigning with him. You're like, oh, do I have to do that? I just want to love you, Lord. I don't really feel like going over and ruling over this country or that country. <laughs> I, I, I've experienced the ecstasy and the pleasure of loving you here in the holy of holies of heaven. And I'm ruined forever, Lord. You've got to sit on the throne. I'm sorry, Brian. <laughs> You've got to go to this country and rule and reign with a rod of iron. I'm telling you, this might be one of the greatest promises God gives us. To eat of that tree of life 
and the Father's love for his Son to be imparted to us. Now, we, we experience this in small measures now, but I'm talking about forever. If we will give our heart, if we will give our heart to loving Jesus as our first love and make that the primary thing we pursue, God will then give us that without any limitations for all of eternity. And we can't even fathom what that's like. To love Jesus like the Father as his overcoming bride for all eternity. So I would say to my younger self, I would say, listen, you're going to be tempted to try to find satisfaction in so many different things. Don't do it. The greatest satisfaction you will ever experience, thus the greatest pursuit you must pursue is to love Jesus as your first love. And if you do that, you will be rewarded with the capacity and the ability to love him even more. The reward of love is love. Number 12, stay hungry and thirsty for God. Let's turn to Psalms chapter 42. Psalms chapter 42. As the deer pants for the water brooks, my soul pants for you, God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? See, I would say to myself, okay, listen, the greatest thing about your life is your hunger and your thirst for God. You lose that, you lose everything. If your hunger and your thirst for God wanes and you become lukewarm, beware. Don't follow the path of much of the American church who has become lukewarm. Gauge yourself, measure yourself, ask yourself, do you still hunger and thirst for God like you used to? Now, that's convicting me. Okay, you start living life and the responsibilities and the cares of life and all the different things that we have to do to get through, to get by, and to do what God's called us to do. Those things start compiling and, you know, piling up on you. And all of a sudden you start feeling like, man, my hunger and my thirst, it doesn't feel like it used to. Jesus called that lukewarm. And Jesus said, I will spew the lukewarm out of my mouth. That, that is a, that's a very dangerous place to be. The problem is we'll never, ever know we're lukewarm. The Lord said to the Laodicean church, you're lukewarm. Do you not know that you're blind, wretched, miserable, naked, poor? They didn't know. See, lukewarmness blinds us to our true condition. When we lack hunger and a thirst for God, or it dissipates, it wanes, it goes down. You know, when we were younger, we had this hunger and we had this thirst for God. And it drove us. And we would spend hours without even looking at the watch, to, you know, and, and seeking God and listening. What are you saying? And worshiping him, being in his word and hearing his voice. And now, 15 minutes seems like an eternity. And we're looking at the watch saying, when's this going to be over? You've grown lukewarm. Your hunger and your thirst for God isn't what it was. And Jesus says, I will spit you out of my mouth. That is unthinkable. I don't want that to be true about me. I do not want the Lord to look at my life and to say, Brian, I'm spewing you out of my mouth. You're distasteful because your passion for Jesus has grown lukewarm. I hope you don't want to be that way either, but we got to fight against lukewarmness. I would say lukewarmness is probably the hardest thing to overcome in the Christian life. I don't know if you agree with me or not, but man, how easy it is to grow lukewarm. How easy it is for that, that hunger and thirst that we once had for God to not be quite like it was. 
And then the things God calls us to do becomes like this incredible burden. And we start complaining, oh, no, i got to do this. Oh, no, i got to do this. And all the different things that, that God is calling you to do. i got to do this. i got to do that. We start grumbling and complaining. That's the voice of the lukewarm heart. Lukewarmness. I want to read Revelation. Let's turn to Revelation. Third, Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. Revelation 3, verse 15. And you know this, but I just want us to read it one more time. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. And so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Lukewarmness is that feeling that, that we're moderately warm, we're tepid, we're that zeal, that passion that we had, that hunger that we had is no longer there. And we don't even know it. That's a problem. We, we don't know it. Now, your wife or your husband might know it or your mom or dad or whoever, your friend might know it. But you're not going to really receive it if they tell you, hey, you're lukewarm. <laughs> the problem is we don't know it. We don't know that our passion is not what it was. Our hunger is not what it was. That, the, the, that, that feeling of indifference, that, well, if I hear from God today, well, that, 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 that would be cool. But if I don't, you know, it's okay. That feeling of like, well, if I get in the Word today and get revelation, that would be cool. But if I don't, you know, it's not going to kill me. I've, I've been there before. And, and that indifference, like, well... It doesn't really matter if I connect with the Lord. You know, man lives by bread alone. It doesn't really matter today if I, if I hear him or not hear him. That indifferent, apathetic feeling that we can have where we're satisfied with where we are. Self-satisfaction. I'm okay. You know, God loves me. He's blessed me. You know, but that, that self-satisfaction that says, I'm okay in my present condition. I'm okay with where I'm at in the Lord. I'm okay. And that hunger and that thirst and that drive has gone imperceptibly, and we don't even know it. Lukewarm. Just... No one sets out on the Christian life to say, hey, when I grow up, I want to be lukewarm. What happens is slowly, the, the, the slow pounding of the cares of the age, the slow pounding of the responsibilities that you carry, the slow pounding of getting busy, of getting distracted, that slow pounding, that little tiny here, little tiny there, it starts piling up and then Six months go by, a year goes by, and that hunger and that thirst you once had is not there. You become lukewarm. Guard above all things your hunger and your thirst for God. I'm speaking to myself today, by the way, so if you're being convicted, I'm preaching to myself, so enjoy the conviction party. But I, I just don't, I don't want to be lukewarm. I don't want to be passive or lazy or a foolish virgin who doesn't have oil when the, Lord, when the bridegroom comes. Here we are at the end of the age, and the Lord is looking. What is your oil supply? Do you have sufficient oil of intimacy with him to carry you so your passion for Jesus burns? See, when we become lukewarm, serving God becomes a duty rather than a delight. When we become lukewarm, 
is the activities God has called us to, to do, we start doing them almost robotically as if there's no feeling or ardor or passion. Not, not all that goes away and we just do it until finally we're just sitting there and we're complaining about this and complaining about that. It's the voice of the lukewarm. See, what is lukewarmness? A lack, it's a lack of hunger for God. It's a lack of passion for God or fulfilling the unique calling God has given us. It's not, it, see, lukewarmness may not even be in your relationship with the Lord. It might actually be in fulfilling the call of God on your life. What has God called you to do? You know, Dad talked about the parable of the talents in the context of being made ready, of multiplying the gifts and the talents God has given you to advance the kingdom of God. Part of getting ready is not just an intimacy. Part of getting ready is actually multiplying the gifts and talents God has given you. <clears throat> Sorry, Mike. <clears throat> I'm getting choked up by this message. My, my congestion is really acting up right now. But... Maybe that was touching. <clears throat> but uh, part of being lukewarm is we're okay. We're indifferent to the fact of, you know, we can love God in the secret place. We can get oil in the secret place. But that calling God has given each one of us or even corporately. We can grow indifferent to that calling. E even us here, we can grow indifferent to the calling to, as a forerunner ministry, to make the bride of Jesus Christ ready in the nations. Eh, if we fulfill it, that's cool. If we don't, eh, I'm still intimate with the Lord. See, even, even related to your calling, we can become indifferent even related to the talents God has given you to multiply. We can bury it and thus not be ready. What has God called you to do? And are you doing it? What has God called you to do? What is God, now I'm not talking about intimacy with him, I'm talking about in ministry. Sometimes I've found that when people get focused on the indwelling life of Christ and living by the indwelling life of Christ, we lose uh, sight of the fact that God has actually given us gifts and talents, callings and anointings to serve and to multiply and to grow to advance the kingdom of God. I don't know if you know what I'm saying, but we can't just sit back in the quiet place with Jesus and not do what he's called us to do. What has God called you to do? What gifts and talents and resources has God give you to, given you to multiply to advance his kingdom? See, the lukewarm heart can say, well, if it, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. That's the very attitude or one of the attitudes that the, the servant with one talent who buried it into the ground... When he stood before the Lord, the Lord called him the wicked, lazy servant. See, multiply what God's given you to do. Sorry, I'm getting refueled, so my congestion here. But C.S. Lewis said that in his famous quote that he said, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. That's lukewarm. We're far too easily satisfied that God would awaken within us a new desire for him, that God would awaken a new hunger and a new thirst for him, 
that we would be driven by this desire, consumed with this desire to please him. I would, I would tell my younger self, Brian, the, the battle for lukewarmness is real. Okay, you're 25, you're naive about life. I don't even know if you're gonna listen to me right now, but you're, you think you know everything, but just wait till you start getting more responsibilities and you start getting more family things to do, things around the house, work, ministry, doing what God's called you to do, all those things start piling up. And then, without realizing it, that hunger and thirst you had when you were 25, it's now become grumbling and complaining about the things you have to do for God. Where you would spend hours without even looking at the watch, now you spend 15 minutes and go, oh, how much longer? Guard against a lukewarm heart. Guard against hunger, losing your hunger and your thirst. Jesus said in verse 18, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire that you may become rich and white garments that you may clothe yourself, that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed, and eye salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. The refiner's fire of God, the refining fire of God, that fire of God comes upon us, consumes self-satisfaction, so that we're not far too easily pleased. We're far too easily pleased. We're far too easily pleased when infinite joy is offered us. We become satisfied with the small things of life. God wants us to go higher and press in for infinite joy and pleasure in him. God finds our desires not too strong but too weak. Oh, that God would awaken a fresh desire in us once again. That we would hunger for him like we used to hunger for him. Oh, that that fresh zeal would come upon us to want to spend time with him and have intimacy with him and be in his word and hear his voice. And to be that voice God has called us to be corporately, prepare the way of the Lord. Make, his straight, make straight his paths. Make ready a people prepared for the Lord. You still with me? Listen to what the Lord says. Verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door to him, this is not a call to salvation. This is a call to intimacy. This is not spoken to the lost, it's spoken to the church. It's the voice of God, I believe, speaking to us on this day. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If you hear my voice and you open the door, I will come in to him and I will dine with him and he with me. What an incredibly rich promise. An invitation to intimacy with Jesus Christ. To dine with him and to know him. <clears throat> He's offering that to us. So I would say to my younger self, guard your hunger and your thirst. Look at, measure your hunger and your thirst and see, okay, do you hunger like you used to? Do you thirst like you used to? And if not, ask the Lord to give you a fresh hunger and a fresh desire. And then number 13, 
is don't try to fit Jesus into your life. Make him the life you live by. Jesus is not meant to be the period at the end of a sentence. He's meant to be the sentence, period. He's meant to be your everything. He's meant to be your entire life. See, in the American church, we say, okay, I'm going to give Jesus two hours on a Sunday, but I'm going to give my life everything else. I'm going to schedule kids' events and family events and sporting events all around all these different things. And then we say, okay, I'm going to fit Jesus into my life. The Lord's like, no, that's American Christianity. That is not the gospel. The gospel says, Jesus, you are my Lord and my Savior. I'm going to schedule my life around you and doing what you have called me to do, and then I'm going to fit the other things in. Now, of course, God wants you to, you know, put your family in a high regard, but I think in America, we've lost sight of the fact that Jesus doesn't want to be fit into your schedule. He wants to be what you, your whole life revolves around. The greatest gift you can give the world is for you to die and Jesus Christ in you to live. That's the greatest gift you can give this world is for you to die and Christ in you to live. That's the greatest gift you can give your family. That's the greatest gift I can give to you as a leader is for me to die in Christ to live. It's the greatest thing you can give to those you work with. It's for you to die in Christ to live. The greatest thing you can give to this world that is desperate for answers is for you to die in Christ to live. So I would say to my younger self, again, you are going to be very tempted to look at the American church and say, okay, well, God, you bless them. Okay, they fit you into their life. And if it's convenient, they'll do this. If it's convenient, they'll, they'll do that. Don't do it. Don't follow in the pattern of the American church and try to fit Jesus into your life. Make him the life you live by. For Christ to live in you to die for him to increase and you to decrease, for his life to flow out of you to a dark, desperate world, wherever you go, that Christ would be exhibited through you, that you would be salt and light wherever he has planted you as influence. Amen. Father, we just come right now and... We cry out to you that, Lord, you would just help us to learn the lessons, Lord. And Father, that, Lord, you would be our first love. I just pray, Lord, right now, even when I was preaching, just, just feeling like, okay, I need this. I'm sure probably others need it. Lord, I, if you want God to increase your hunger and thirst for him, just hold up your hands right now. I hold my hand up. Without even realizing it, your hunger and thirst for God can, can, can dissipate. Lord, I just want to pray right now for all of us with our hands raised, my hands are raised, Lord, that you would increase our hunger and our thirst for you, Lord. Yeah. Lord, that you would just burn away the lukewarmness, Lord. And Lord, Lord, I'm not even talking about a feeling of guilt or condemnation. I'm talking about the grace of God coming, the power of God coming um, upon us in our heart and, and giving us that fresh, fresh zeal and passion, Lord. Lord, I'm praying right now, Lord, that the power of God that enables us to be who you've called us to be and to do what you've called us to do would be stirred up within us. That power of God would be stirred up, Lord. I'm asking you for that. Lord, that you might give us fresh hunger and fresh thirst for the living God. Lord, that you might expose to us, Lord, as that, as that sword cutting between flesh and spirit, cutting between the soul and the spirit, going down into the very heart 
of the matter, that we might have, uh, Lord, our deeds revealed and exposed. Show us the areas of lukewarmness, Lord, I pray, where we have grown lukewarm. And Lord, set a fire inside of our hearts, Lord, I pray. Set a fire in our hearts, Lord, I pray, that we would have a fresh, holy, burning passion for Jesus Christ that overcomes a thousand evils. Lord, I pray that we would come into that relationship with you of enjoying you, of dining with you, of knowing you, Lord, I pray. Baptize our hearts, Lord, with fresh fire. Lord, baptize our hearts with fresh desire. Lord, I'm asking you, Lord, where grace comes and gives us new desires. Lord, I'm asking you for grace to come right now and give us those new, fresh desires for you like we've never had. I'm praying this for myself. I'm praying this for everyone who has their hand raised. Lord, would you come and would you give us those fresh desires of grace? That grace would triumph in our heart, Lord. That we would no longer serve out of duty, but we would overflow out of delight. Lord, that we would no longer become robots of obligation, Lord, but we would do it out of a passion that flows out of us by the fire of God burning inside of us. Lord, would you ignite in us, Lord, first love uh, and an overcoming of lukewarmness that our hearts would be baptized in fire, we pray. We ask that, Lord, in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Amen. We'll end the online portion right now. Thank you so much for tuning in. All right, so now we're, we want to pray for the uh, kids. Um, so I think Angie, someone was going to get Angie, possibly, as you told uh, Michael. Yeah, you want to get Angie. So we're going to pray for kids as they go back to school, start going back to school next week, um, just that God would set them apart. And I'm going to pray up here. I'm not going to get close to them. Just I'm not contagious, but just, you know, hand me the Kleenex there if you don't mind, Dad. Yeah, sorry. I made it through. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Dad, were you nervous about touching it? <laughs> uh, yeah. <sighs> Randall Treese, why don't you guys do the praying since you guys have not had COVID? <sighs> huh? Yeah, the teachers as well. Yeah, the, the teachers who 